Hi, this is John Ainsworth, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. How are you on this beautiful winter's day, we'd like to say to our UK fans. How are you, Philip? <laughs> oh, I'm a bit chilly, actually. <laughs> I'm freezing down here in Tasmania, absolutely freezing. It hit zero degrees I saw the other day down there. Zero? That's, yeah, like a daily occurrence, but, you know... I bet the UK folks are going, you think zero's bad? That's nothing. <laughs> That's nothing. But anyway, we all get used to where we are, don't we? Yep. Uh, today is uh, another episode of what we like to call... We've got randomoids. <coughs> yes, it's randomoids time again. And last time, Philip, you were in control of the randomoid selectatron. And do you recall that I wasn't very happy with the selections? Well, Based on my initial listens. I don't think you said that on air. You just said that to me personally. <laughs> no, no, I did say it. Oh, did you say you weren't particularly happy? Oh, there you yeah, go. Yeah, well, I, I reacted. I reacted and went, oh, okay. Yeah. And so, but I was willing to go in and give these two selections another try because I thought you had gone in uh, with an open mind previously and you had changed your opinion, particularly on an Unbound story that we did recently, Full Fathom 5. So this being another one of the Unbound series, I thought it was interesting to start off with that we were doing an Unbound one, but we're going back um, into that again. So before we do that, Philip, do you know where we've got to go? No. Where Just for a few minutes. Go? Yeah, where are we going? Greg? Come on, let's jump in. It's a okay. rabbit hole. Here we go. <laughs> So here in the rabbit hole today, Philip, I just want to talk briefly about something like you You and I last week were doing something for, for your, and not, nothing to do with the sirens of audio, but we got on a Zoom call and we did some recordings for, for your work. And I picked up on the fact that you said to me, I thought you just did this as live. And I wondered what kind of an appreciation you got from our experience doing that for what Big Finish do because it's pretty seamless what they do with particularly with remote recording but we were stopping and starting and I was waiting for traffic to go past and uh, it was a quite a different process to what you imagined uh, the recording was going to be uh, and I was doing a voiceover for you so did you get a, a bit more of an appreciation for what Big Finish do and how complex it actually is? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, one of the things I think surprised me most about recording, yeah, so sort of the audio files out there, um, I work in an engagement space and Dwayne's been doing voiceovers for me so I can actually put animations and videos to them because um, I love his voice. Um, oh, shucks. But, <laughs> but the thing that I think struck me more was the fact that when when, we, when something went wrong or word went wrong, you didn't go back to what I thought would have been an obvious place and start again. You just started mid-sentence or mid-word or... And that you were going to put all that together and make it all make sense. And so when I got it, it was seamless. But having actually listened to you do it and when, when you stopped and when you fumbled and when you picked things up again, I always assumed that you would have gone back to the start of a paragraph or back to even the start of a sentence. You didn't do that. You just picked up mid mid midway or wherever you were. And that, that surprised me. Um, but then when you edited it together, it was totally seamless. So I guess yeah, that, that, that showed me in terms of yeah what... Big finish others must do. It, it, you know, what a complex task! And this, you were just one voice, but also yes. the, but also the fact too that the power that the edit has in terms of pacing and in terms of the actors get to make choices. Of course they do, um, but more than just the actors making choices, 
um, the editor gets a lot of power and control as well in terms of the pacing, where they put pauses, because you changed things up. You added pauses in that we had to put in so I could, you know, which then gave me control to edit what I was doing because of, you know, the different sections and I could make them longer and shorter. So, yeah, there's a big complex um, wheel at work to make an audio work. And when you're dealing with remote recording, as Big Finish had to do because of the pandemic, you've got all these different individuals with different, you know, everyone has their own perception of working with technology and, and ways of dealing with different technologies. And I, I think that logistical challenge uh, of the directors and the producers involved in getting all the artists up to speed with um, remote recording, I think is absolutely incredible. It's I, I don't think we give big finish enough credit for the the work they pioneered in in remote recording during the pandemic yeah i agree and also just the fact that they're working with even just different quality microphones mm. um i mean yeah i'm i'm not using a particularly flash microphone at all and you're making me jealous now with your brand new <laughs> microphone you're using today i'm trying <laughs> um and and i know that you know I, and i know you struggle in terms of making sure that our sound quality is equal and and yeah so big finish have to do that with multiple artists with multiple microphones of various quality whereas like you know i think you know often <laughs> my microphone isn't as good and you know sometimes you do struggle to make a sound exactly the same so that we do sound like we're in the same space i don't know how they managed to do it with eight to ten artists mm. or with different microphones i think that's pretty astounding that they managed to get that you know conformity so you can't tell they're not in the same space or room i, I do think big finish organized the artists to have the same microphone i think they send it out to them Oh, do they? I, I just... I, I, I'm pretty sure that's what how how it works. They the similar gear. They've all got similar gear, but then you've still got individuals who you know maybe struggle a bit with technology. Operating systems might be different. They might be using Apple as opposed to uh, Windows, or most of the artists might be using Windows when sound designers, I'm sure, would prefer to use Apple. So you know, there's lots and lots of different things to think about, and uh, I just want to give kudos to to all involved. Uh, in the remote recording side of Big Finish, because they still do a bit of it. I think the the joy of remote recording is uh, a bit divided in terms of Big Finish. Some of the guys love it, some of them hate it. Uh, I know Colin Baker in particular; he loves it uh, because you know some of the actors love it because they don't have to they don't have to travel; they can stay in their jimmy jams and and do their recording throughout the day at home. But yeah, and and some really enjoy the studio experience as well. So uh, there there's but every everything has worked well together and it's been pretty seamless you know working on edits all the time myself i could pick up a few things here and there in some of the early remote recordings i went ah this is what's happened here and i couldn't quite fix that sound there and uh but i think that's because i work with editing all the time that yeah, i was able I, to pick I that up i, I don't think, notice that i don't think the casual listener would uh, would really notice that at all it was well i'm not casual thank you very much i'm an active okay. listener all right, <laughs> but no, I don't, I don't, I don't pick up all that stuff. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think the whole pandemic has taught us actually that there's strengths and weaknesses of both. Mm. I, mean, I, I mainly work from home now, but yesterday I was, in, you know, went into the office into the city and had a lovely time, and yeah, you know, we went out for lunch for Thai, and but I don't get as much work done when I go into the office because you spend so much time seeing people and getting so excited to see people live. But uh, yeah, it's, there's there's strengths and advantages of, of both going in and staying home. Very good. Let's climb up out of the rabbit hole. We've got uh, a lot on tonight. We're going to be not only re reviewing our randomoid selections tonight, we're going to be talking with the author of one of them. Tony Lee is joining us. He's going to talk to us about Rat Trap. So here is a trailer for the first story that we're going to talk about. It's Doctor Who Unbound, A Storm of Angels. Look at the stars above below. So many possibilities. Resistance will be crushed. <laughs> no, not for long. Who's there? John Dean. I hear thy voice, Philip, but know thee not. If thou art bound by my summons, show no duplicity, reveal thyself. We are watching. Who are you? What do you desire? Knowledge! Then behold the symmetry of the heaven. 
Doctor. You're tearing a rift in the time vortex. Pull back. You're dragging us both through. Agent Zero to control. The Doctor's breaking custody. Control. Can you hear me? Zero to control. These are my last coordinates. I'm being dragged in. Eight, five, three, five, two, eight, nine, eight. Righto, so that was a trailer for A Storm of Angels. Now, I have always loved Jeffrey Baldwin's appearance in The Creature from the Pit. I, I, I love Cat Weasel. Who didn't uh, uh, grow up with Cat Weasel? Those of us our age, uh, it was on television and we and we really enjoyed Cat Weasel as well. So it was nice to get Jeffrey Baldwin in this. Um, and even though at the time they said that this was not... Uh, this was not an alternative this was not the William Hartnell doctor who stayed on Gallifrey in old mortality the very first one I don't know I'm still not convinced because he, he's so close to to William Hartnell in so many respects to me personally that um that it, it probably was supposed to be the first doctor but big finishes policy at the time this came out which was 2005 it um it, it was probably Big Finish's policy to to not have recasts at the time. It was very sacrosanct to, to even suggest recasting at that time, which is you know gone by the wayside now. But um, yeah, so I was always interested in Jeffrey Baldwin, uh, Mark Platt, fantastic writer. He writes some very very interesting stuff. But I've got to say. And I hope I'm not burning any bridges with Mark Platt here, but sometimes I just don't understand his stuff. Now, it's not not the case with this that I don't understand his stuff, but it's it's not the easiest kind of storytelling to 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 wrap your ears around. You've really, really got to focus on Mark Platt. It's very similar to Ghostlight. A lot of people find Ghostlight confusing, and you've got to go back. Everything is there in Ghostlight, the TV, unedited series. You can work out what's going on, but it's still highly complex and the way it's presented is very unique and very different and i find that with a lot of mark platt's writing in big finish as well but before i get into the story itself philip uh what uh, what are your thoughts on uh, a storm of angels this is the sequel did you go back and listen to old mortality first i really wanted to but didn't get a chance to i've just been swamped with listening at the moment and life um but i mean i, I do remember Old mortality. Um, it's it, it's interesting, isn't it? That this is. I think this was the first one. There was only a couple. So there's that, that initial run of Unbounds, and I think Old mortality was the. It was. It was the first one that came out, mm. and I loved it. Like it was just wonderful. Jeffrey Bolden as alternative Doctor just made sense. Um, I think yeah, he he was probably one of the Doctors who you really thought should have been cast as the Doctor, and he isn't William Hartnell, but you can see him being a William Hartnell type. I think. The reason why it's not William Hartnell, of course, is because this is a doctor who is happy to interfere in history, where William Hartnell was, you can't change history, not one line, um, as he proclaimed to Barbara in the Aztecs. And so where William Hartnell's doctor was all about, you don't alter anything, you don't change anything, it must stay the same, a real purist there, this is a doctor who is happy to change anything and doesn't really care about the consequences. So it's a very different doctor. So after that initial run of Unbounds, this is 2005, so it's about two years later. And there's only a couple of Doctors that got to make a sequel. Um, um, David Warner being the other one, which is sort of the third Doctor substitute who, who was working with the Brigadier anyhow. Um, in terms of the story, yeah, it's I think you're right. I think Mark Platt really makes you think. And you can never approach a Mark Platt script simply. Um, it's not something, and, I, and there was several times, um, I was listening to some of this on the train yesterday, I actually had to go back and re-listen to bits because I knew I'd missed fighting opponents. Something would happen, I was thinking, hang on a second, how did that happen with, with the Queen? And I had to go back and re-listen to stuff to, ah, oh, okay, just to see how things fitted together. So it is all there, but it is a complex jigsaw, which is his strength. It, it is also, you know, it's a, it can be frustrating. And, and I mean, I love Ghost Light. I, I think it suffers a bit from the edit. It really should have been four episodes rather than three. But it is just a brilliant work, brilliant ideas and concepts. I, yeah, not, not, I've, not that I agree with all the, his thinking and views, but I do love how he plays down on the page. And I think Storm of Angels, where you take a doctor who has interfered with the past 
and progressed human so being. much, so <laughs> much. Um, but you can, you, but you can see all the lines, and you can see how he's drawn the lines there. But in terms of, you still got strong characters. You've got a very strong relationship between the Doctor and Susan, though that's complex as well. Um, it really is a very clever script that works works at several levels. Um, I, I would just say all the Unbounds, they they to me their strength and their weakness is the same thing, which is part of the reason why we love Doctor Who is because of who the Doctor is. That the Doctor is someone who is a hero who makes situations better. He makes people better, even though they often die. But he's a doctor because he improves the situation for people. Whereas with a lot of the unbound doctors, and this is one of them, actually he makes life worse. And so it's fascinating to look at a, look at a, a different take at the doctor. What what would happen with a doctor who didn't care about the consequences, who did allow changes to be made? And here we see basically the, the destru- you know heading towards the destruction of Earth because the doctor has interfered. And so you see, what does it look like for Doctor Who defeats? So the strength is, it's wonderful to see that in terms of, you know, it's lovely to have this unbound, what would happen if, you know, it's, it's the whole what if series, which is becoming very popular at the moment in, in Marvel and other places. But it's also the, but the reason why we love the Doctor is because he doesn't do that. So you do have this twin dilemma. I still came away at the end of it, remembering how I felt the first time I heard it. And I felt similarly, it was enjoyable hearing it. I enjoyed the twist at the end of part three with uh, Susan turning up. I suppose we can say it with the the real Susan turning up because we had Susan all through the story up to that point. And we find we've got two different Susans. So there's a story surrounding that. Susan has now become the president of Gallifrey. So that's interesting in itself. Um, And I could... I could sort of predict the ending too in relation to Susan. So I won't spoil that, but uh, I was waiting for that to happen. Probably my memory of it uh, was coming back and I thought, yeah, this is what's going to happen. I think it was more, it was much more of a character piece than, uh, than so much of a, 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 of a interesting science fiction story to me personally. Um, Cause I didn't really get to know, I, I couldn't really work out what the, what, what the aliens were. Uh, and I still couldn't at the end of it. So I thought, oh yeah, this is all very interesting. It's very symbolic. Um, one thing I did like about it very much was the music, because when the when the when the music throughout the production started at the beginning, it reminded me of of Neverland. It reminded me of Zagreus, all the fantastic sounds from that particular set of stories. And I had had a look at who did the music, and it's uh, by a group called ERS, which is a more less than a group. It's two guys um, who who are in ERS, and uh, they did the music for this. And yes, they did also do the music for Zagreus and many, many, many other Big Finish stories as well. So uh, I really enjoyed uh, that aspect of it too. Uh, but as far as it goes, it's not my favourite Unbound, and I think I feel a little bit of disappointment too because I really love Jeff- Jeffrey Bailden, and I wanted him to be. <laughs> I wanted him to be my favourite, but it, the stories are certainly not my favourite stories, but certainly well worth a listen. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a marvellous cast. It, it, it mentioned ERS. I'd love to know a bit more about them, actually. Maybe we need to investigate. A couple of last thoughts. Um, Casting-wise, um, or well, yeah, so John, John Ainsworth has directed this, and of course he doesn't do a lot of directing, and so it's always interesting the cast he pulls. Um, but I guess it's standing... You know, head and shoulders by everyone. It's Jeffrey Belden and Carol Ann Ford are just wonderful together. And really, the relationship they strike up in these two CDs that they do together is really very tight and very close. And yeah, I love Carol Ann Ford getting the opportunity to do more interesting things with Susan. I think there's there's, mo- there's moments in the this, this first season she's in that she gets some really great character moments and some good acting times. But I do think she misses out often. I don't think writers write Susan very well. For some strange reason, they wrote Vicky much better than Susan, which I don't quite understand. But anyhow, for whatever reason, um, generally speaking, Susan didn't get written as well as um, other characters. Certainly not Barbara or Ian. Um, and so it's good getting her, she's getting some solid material to, to sink her teeth in. And certainly in the, in the fourth episode, um, when we have two Susans, you get a good opportunity to actually you know, explore that. It's got very strong A and B plots, this and even a C plot. 
this this story and so as i said once again the complexity of following it but yeah really worth a listen and it's not very expensive at the moment uh it's 2.99 unbound song of angels real worth listening to is it the best unbound probably not um but if you like seeing the whole what if scenarios it's another great one to listen to and it follows on really well um it's, it is a great sequel to the, the first one can i just pick up on a couple of things you said uh during that uh firstly cast uh we've got ian brooker in there who is yeah. one of uh big finishes company of actors who is a very recognizable voice particularly in the early years of big finish although he is throughout the whole history of big finish but he's he's always there and i was thinking about i was I was actually driving along listening to this in the car the other day and I was smiling thinking, oh, I've heard Ian Brooker's voice so many times. But then thinking about his voice, it is such a good voice for audio. It is no wonder he was used all the time. It is so distinctive. Uh, and he does a couple of different voices uh, throughout this uh, story too. So uh, I love I love Ian Brooker. He, get, he often got a little bit of criticism for being in so many plays, but... Uh, he, he was a great addition to the Big Finish uh, family. I must admit, I had to look up Kate Brown as Queen Elizabeth because th- it sounded like Samantha Bond right. when I was listening. I thought, oh, that sounds like Mrs. Wormwood from Sarah Jane Smith, but I, right. it wasn't. Yes, I, I thought so too. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention too was John Ainsworth. Now, keep in mind that uh, a couple of years before this, he had produced a series called Space 1889. Do you remember that? It was like a steampunky... Uh, so it was obviously set in 1889, but it was like the Vic- Victorian era in space. Okay. So he, it was similar themes in this. Uh, so obviously the, some of the ideas he had in space 1889 were, uh, were he was able to utilise it here. So what better person to direct this than John Ainsworth, I thought, with, uh, with that under his belt as well. It's a bit like the Peter Capaldi story with the Us Warriors. Yeah, a little bit like that. Hmm, okay. A little bit like that. They're worth. They're they're hard to get now. I don't think they're available anymore. Definitely worth a listen to those if you can track them down. All right, uh, that's all for a storm of angels. We're going to talk about another story that when you pulled it out of the randomoid select selectatron, I reacted and went oh like this because my memories of the following story were not good. Here's a trailer for Rat Trap coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who, Rat Trap. <laughs> Sounds like someone's in trouble. We should go and help. Turlo, look at this. A dead rat in an old abandoned tunnel. Who'd have thought it? It's much larger than a normal Terran rat. There's something strange here. We're trapped out here. There's always a way out, Kevin. We just have to find it. Forgive me, Doctor, but you seem to be enjoying this. It does that. Did you hear that? Hear what? That voice. You are not! Take that! We Your time is ended, for we are everywhere. Oh no. Oh no, please no. Oh, don't take me. Oh, what the hell is that? I think it was human, but as for what it is now... Oh. Whatever it is, it's strong. Doctor! Rat! Behind us! No! Look out, Andrews! What was that? The tunnel's collapsing, I expect. Too much structural damage. The entire place will probably fall in a matter of minutes. Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com. All right, Philip. So there are two stories that we're reviewing today, and one of them, I'm not really changing my opinion on too much. It's about the same, which you've obviously heard. But this one, Rat Trap, I have done a full 180. Uh, I loved listening to this again, and it reminded me how good this second set of 100 stories from the monthly range is. And it got me thinking, oh man, we've got, a, we've got some exploring to do in this era, Philip. We certainly have. I very much enjoyed this, but it got me thinking, why did I not enjoy it the first time around? Now, there's a few things. I looked at the the release date and it was June 2011. So in in May 2011 was a very, very bad month for me. I had a a long-term relationship breakup happen. Um, So I was suddenly finding myself living alone, 
I was also doing all my listening uh, without headphones. So it was either on the stereo at home or it was in the car. And the if there is one element that grates on me with Rat Trap, it is the production of the, the rat's telepathic voices going all the way throughout. I found them very difficult to, to, to understand, but listening to them in the headphones was a completely different experience. And obviously that's how the editors are hearing it. They're not hearing it while they're driving in the car doing the editing. But driving in the car, it was really, really hard to understand. And with all that other stuff going on, I wasn't interested in investing all my concentration into this story. But when you think about the story, it is really, really good stuff. And not only that, but I listened to the extended extras at the end and this story came about because there are a couple of scripts that that were delayed by a year or two. So Alan Barnes had to come up with a new script and Nick Briggs actually recommended Tony Lee uh, for this script. And I think it's a really strong script. Um, the story is uh, featuring the Fifth Doctor and uh, the TARDIS team of Nyssa, uh, Tegan and... Turlow, so Nyssa having returned to the TARDIS team, and what I also picked up were there are a lot of references to all the surrounding Fifth Doctor stories that I've forgotten about. So there's lots of continuity in there that got me thinking, oh, I must go back and listen to that because uh, Tegan, uh, Nyssa is worried about the Richter syndrome, so that's all related to what, why she's cooperating with the, with the rats and so forth. And um, yeah, so it got me thinking about the continuity. Um, and the, the, the story itself is all about the unethical treatment of animals and what if the tables were turned. Um, or it's not even suggesting it's unethical. It's just saying animal experimentation could be unethical. What if the tables were turned? Would we feel the same? Uh, so it's very, very interesting. I had forgotten completely that Terry Malloy was in this in an absolutely sensational role. And I was speaking about the music earlier. One thing I picked up on the music from A Storm of Angels, because there's about, this was 2011, Storm of Angels 2005, so uh, six or seven years between the recordings of these, and the music was very similar. And I saw ERS on Storm of Angels, and I saw Andy Hardwick on Rat Trap. Andy Hardwick is one of the members of ERS. I can't remember who the other guy is. I heard you typing away, Philip. I hope you're looking him up. So the music was very familiar, and I really enjoy Andy Hardwick's music. So, yeah, can we have some more of that, please? From remembering this as a painful experience and not wanting to go back and sort of piecing together all the reasons why I didn't enjoy it at the time, I can, I can always say that it's worth going back and revisiting some of these stories that you may have initially not enjoyed so much because... Uh, you may find that things are different. Particularly the headphones experience for this, for me, was like a completely different experience. I don't know how you felt, Philip. Yeah. Well, let, let me give you a few of my things. So um, Gareth Jenkins was the other person. Gareth Jenkins, that's right. Yeah, that, that name sounds really familiar as well. He, he must have done individual sound design as well, did he? Couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Okay. I'd have to look into it. Let me do some research in that. Anyhow, um, maybe. <laughs> And maybe before we finish, we'll just pop into our heads as we open up our internet browsers. Um, in terms of Rat Trap, um, I once again, this is a this whole era for me is a kind of forgotten era, and I would have listened to this at the time and forgotten. It I started with my first negative. It has got my pet peeve, which is animals as monsters. <laughs> um, I think that's that is one of the things in terms of, and you mentioned the voices. Why is it a pet peeve? Um, a pet peeve. Get it. <laughs> Yeah, pet peeve. <laughs> um, I think I think I, I really struggle when they start trying to put on voices for animals, and I think that's what's what's going on here. So um, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, the, the rats are a bit hard to understand, and a lot of conversation with rats. I think if the voice had been a bit more naturalistic, a bit less sound produced, I would have enjoyed it a bit more. I, I think yeah, I, but I mean, I, I have said before. I think all the Doctor Who shows, which are all totally alien, totally yeah, animals. Um, yeah, I, I like the human qualities a bit more, though I did appreciate what they was doing. 
Um, one of the books I used to teach all the time when I was teaching was a book called Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien. And that is actually like this. Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim is about a group of rats that are being experimented on and they're being pushed to be smarter and smarter and smarter. And they're actually smarter than the scientists realize they are and they manage a breakout. And so there's a group of smart mice, there's a group of smart rats, but only two mice escape because they go through the air ventilators and the air conditioning turns on and all the poor mice get blown away and only two of the mice escape. And one of them marries Mrs. Frisbee and they have super intelligent babies as well. Um, and so it's a whole story about these rats, these super intelligent rats and trying to hunt them down. And it's very, very clever, but similar, except these, are the, these rats are escaped and don't want to destroy the world. They just want to live in peace and create their own society. And they want to stop stealing. And so they don't they don't want to produce their own power. They want to produce all their own food and harvest and things. And how can these rats live in peace? So if, if you've not read it, um, so that, that's going to be my recommendation at the end, probably. Uh, brilliant book. Um, so there's similarities between that book, which is why I really did enjoy this story. I think one of the clever things that um, the author's done is the way he's managed to combine... Um, all the different cast members so they've got things to do um, having, having a large large number of regular crew getting them to find interesting things to do is hard and I really did think it I, I'd forgotten the story as I said I would have listened to it in 2011 I wouldn't have listened to it since so it's been 10, 11 years since I've listened to this um, and so what Tony has done uh, when, when Turlo went into the ship I thought, oh, they're just sidelining him and he'll have nothing to do. In the end, they actually gave him quite a fascinating plot, being hunted by the rats, and a bit of the, yeah, there's a bit of a reveal there with the person he's with. But they, they well set up all the different characters in different locations with different objects and different things to do, and, and they use their skills well. As you say, this is the old Anissa, and I think, I think it's nine audios altogether with the old Anissa. I meant to go back and double check how many there were, because they, they came out in trilogies. If, at this stage so there'd be three at a time that would be coming out and part of the trouble with this range was I'd forgotten what happened in the previous trilogy by the time the next trilogy came out which <laughs> this says a lot about my mind and so it was interesting to listen to so this so imagine and, what it's like now oh I know <laughs> um, but it was interesting that one, once Nissa started talking about is it Richter's disease I forget, I forget what the disease Richter's is Richter's syndrome I think Richter's syndrome so uh, yeah when the doctor first picks her up she's trying to this is this disease that's spreading across the, across the galaxy and she's on the forefront of trying to design a cure for it and in a previous episode she's got a cure but that's now destabilizing so it was interesting as all that conversation was going on which was the sort of the linking narrative over the nine or more stories that these four were in and, and is I that sh- what she was still working on in the killing time box set last year was she still working on that? Yes, was she was. To, no, yeah. no, yes, that was the same thing she was working on. So it's interesting that you've got these links that I did remember so the actual details of this story I hadn't remembered and it and it didn't really come back to me because there was those couple of character switches and reveals that I had forgotten. And when they happened, I went, oh, oh, okay, which is strange, but I had remembered the, the big linking narrative happening between them all. So yeah, very entertaining. Um, once again, the cast do an amazing job. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it's a traditional, more of a traditional script than the Mark Platt one. Mark Platt weaves complex lines between people you're never quite sure where they're going this one i think is a lot more traditional in terms of you've got the surplus class to kill off and so so you know oh yeah these these three or four cast members we don't really need them they're going to die and this one's bad so they're going to die and so you can see as it's you can see how it's a bit more how it's been designed to work um but that's what makes a good doctor who story and let's face it we love it and and there is a couple of little twists in there that you know supplant your expectations which which is what makes it so well um, yeah, really, really enjoyed it. And it, it, it does a great job of exploring the idea of experimentation on animals and the ethics behind it without it. It just weaves it into the story and makes you think about it without platforming it, which is always a good thing. Yes. Yeah. We, we don't need to be preached to as Doctor Who fans. You know, we, we want to, authors to raise issues make us think about issues without being preached at and i think once again yeah i think tony's done a really good job in terms of raising issues ethical issues that we should think about 
Um, I, I think he's. I mean, I think he's. He's just got got clever themes in here. As I said, you know, the, the overriding theme of all the CDs in part is Nissa being much older. Like she's fifty. It's fifty years on, so she's way way older. She doesn't. She still looks young because Triconites obviously don't age fast. Um, I mean, she's you know looking strange, like her real age must have been when she recorded this. But but she's it's fifty years have passed, and so she is a more mature Nissa. Um, but they they telescope the fact that she's worked with with her, the, the um, Richter syndrome, with the fact of the the Black Plague and rats and the 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 the, the burial holes here. So there's all these different things that the author has included, which telescope other ideas, which you know help help you understand the bigger concept, the overriding themes. Yeah, it, it's it's there's a lot in this if you really wanted to break it down and start seeing what's being done here. Yeah, and it's uh, unusual too that uh, this is, I think this might be the only Doctor Who script for Big Finish by Tony Lee, is that right? It is. He's only done four or five scripts, and so most of them, were, there's a couple of Benny and then this one. Benny and Dark Shadows, is uh, not Dark Shadows, Dorian Gray. Did he do this, one or yes, two of them? He did a Dorian Gray. I think he did one Dorian Gray, two Bernice and this. So he hasn't, he hasn't done much at all for Big Finish. But he's got a huge career outside of here. Absolutely. Why don't we talk to Tony about that? Let's see what uh, what he has to say. But as far as the story goes, yeah, I'm I'm converted to this after ten years of avoiding it. I've been forced to go back, and I'm so glad that we did. So let's have a chat with Tony Lee right now. So welcome, Tony. It's great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Um, thank you. And I'm um, sorry it took me a while to get to turn up. I scheduling and and everything else just sort of threw me for a bit so oh it's part of life that's okay um i just want to start off by just asking you in terms of um your interest in doctor who and well actually all things fantasy because you seem to have a very strong fantasy bent how did, how did you first get into doctor who <laughs> um so i'm 52 years old and my first actual memory and i mean genuinely my first actual memory was sitting on my father's lap with all of my family, so that's my brothers, uh, my mum, my dad, me, all sitting around the TV watching um, uh, John Pertwee regenerate into Tom Baker at the end of Planet of the Spiders. That is literally my first ever memory. So from a, from from day zero, my family kind of indoctrinated me into Doctor Who. So, um, so as a kid, I loved it. Obviously, I grew up through the Tom Baker years. Um, I kind of started to really understand it a lot more though I will say around the Logopolis time when Peter Davison turned up and back then I mean obviously you guys will know this and but a lot of the younger fans don't really get this but back then my my streaming services and DVDs for old episodes were called target novelizations yeah you know because unless you watch the episode live you couldn't ever see it again unless BBC decided to do something about like putting it on on a summer holiday or something like that um, it was only until, in fact, UK Gold, which was a st- uh, satellite channel we had in, in the UK, started repeating everything on in the 90s on Sunday mornings that a lot of people saw these. And I just got into Target. So I just bought all my Target novelizations. I learned about the first Doctor, the second Doctor, etc. And and it was again, it was, it was a lot of it was the Terence Dix novels. And, you know, and, and Terence Dix had a way of taking the stories and, and kind of making them a bit more understandable to somebody who was just coming into it a lot younger, so to speak. Um, and yeah, and just I just followed it on. And so since literally Tom Baker, I followed every single doctor as I've gone along. I mean, when I was you know a kid, I'd sit there working out my own stories and, and playing, um, you know, versions of games but when I was attacking Daleks and, and all that kind of thing. I had an action man. Uh, in America, they call him G.I. Joes. Uh, but my action man, my mum had made me a multicoloured jacket because it was around the time of um, of Colin Baker. And I had a, and he was the doctor. So I had him and he had a, a, a six million dollar man figure was his companion. Uh, so it was, it was a very surreal story. But I used to write these little stories and, and play them around. Uh, and in fact, um, something that isn't really known is when I was 17 years old, I actually sent uh, Andrew Cartmel uh, a script for a Seventh Doctor story that never got done purely, purely not because I was this unknown 17 year old kid who thought he had a chance, but it was purely because that's when the show was cancelled. And that's the only reason I wasn't doing the TV. Has Andrew told you this? <laughs> 
And obviously, if you ask Andrew, he'll tell you, no, the 17-year-old kid sent me something and it was rubbish. But we ignore that. We ignore that. <laughs> well, you know, maybe Big Finch could do as a lost story. Still, have we still got it sitting around somewhere? Oh, it was awful. It was absolutely <laughs> terrible. I, I think I just basically, I think it was, I think it was the um, the seventh doctor in his Merlin phase bumps into John Constantine. It was literally a terrible mashup <laughs> of teenage angst and, and why won't the goal I like go out with me? So it was a lot of that kind of thing. So you're, from target books, you're reading and you led you into a writing phase. So is that when you decided that you were going to be a writer? I was always interested in writing. Um, my dad, um, so when I got married, um, by the way, I do apologise. I go off on random tangents. So if I do start going off on an anecdote, just tell me to shut up and I will. But when I got married about 10 years ago, my dad uh, did a speech because uh, I'm an Irish family. So and my mum's passed away. Uh, and he talked about how, you know, uh, they used to go camping and all the eight year old kids would turn up and ask for Tony to tell them a story. And I had to point out to the entire reception that I was eight at the time as well. It wasn't just that I was some kind of weird old man who told stories to eight year old kids. But um, from eight, you know, I, my dad um, was the main reason I studied, wanted to be a writer. But he came across from Ireland when he was 14. He didn't really do his exams. He wasn't a reader. Uh, and so when I, my mum was a voracious reader. So when I was a kid, like a little kid, my mum would read me stories to go to bed. My dad would tell me stories. He'd make things up. And, you know, he'd sort of say, you know, give me a bad guy, give me a good guy. What do you want to talk about? And he would just improvise stories for me. And that, I think, kind of started me on the route. And, and yeah, I think it was, um, I was, I do a lot of school talks in the UK, in America, where I talk about how as a kid, I was a reluctant reader and I hated books. I hated novels, um, not because I didn't like reading. It was just, I found them boring. I just could not get my head into them. And in the end, um, there was a writer who came to my school and, and sort of said, said to me, look, you know, you do read books. You just told me you read Doctor Who novels, that's books. But my teachers at the time were like, you know, that's not a book that, you know, you should be reading these special books that have been written by people 200 years ago. So I'd kind of rebelled against it. But then I realised that, you know, yeah, Terence Dix was the guy who I was reading and therefore I wanted to be Terence Dix. And I did want to write, but at the same time, I was then a teenage kid and I watched Superman 3. And I realised that if you could control computers, you could control the world. And I decided I wanted to be a, a, a computer programmer. And that lasted until my first year of sixth form, which was um, 17 years old. And I couldn't get work experience in computers. And the only place I could get work experience was a computer magazine that was reviewing games. And I had a Sinclair Spectrum and I just contacted them out of the blue and said, hey, look, you know, I'm doing work experience. Could I review a game or two? And they said yes. So weirdly, at 16 years old, I you know, just before 17, I was writing professionally for a games magazine you know, without even trying in a way. And then once you get that one thing, the portfolio helps because you get to turn around and say, hey, I'd like to come and do this. And then they say, well, what have you done? And I can sort of show something. And then when I left school, I moved into um, into radio. Uh, I was working for local papers. I became a journalist and, and that kind of got me writing. But I wasn't actually getting into more creative writing like comics and, and uh, film TV, stuff like that, until I hit 33. So I literally, for about 15 years after I did this um, starting, I went through everything that wasn't creative. Literally, I was a journalist. I worked in radio advertising. I was a marketing manager for a theatre. I did everything that was kind of related. But I wouldn't make that step because I didn't think I was good enough because I still had this thing in my head that said, you know, I like comics and that's not real books. Um, and so, yeah, so a long-winded answer, but... As a kid, I, it was Doctor Who in a way that did it because it was Terence Dicks, but I'd always kind of wanted to tell stories. So your, your first sort of credits seemed to be cartoons, comics, so comics, graphic novels starting about 2003 or so. Is that sort yep. of... Yeah, this is it. I was, it was actually, it was um, the first thing that came out was an X-Men Unlimited uh, story for Marvel Comics in February 2004. So I was 33 years old. And, and to be perfectly honest, I'd hit that point where I was working for a 
marketing company in Birmingham. A wonderful place, uh, lovely guys, you know, never had anything bad to say about them. And I was actually working on the summer conference for the Labour Party, uh, which is obviously the opposition at the moment in the UK. And I, I just didn't want to do it. I wanted to get into comics and I wanted to do other things. And I was a fan of Doctor Who. And at the time we were in the wilderness years and, you know, there was nothing happening. And I decided I wanted to try something. And so I contacted Clayton Hickman, who was at the time the editor of Doctor Who magazine and said, look, you know, I'd like to try writing something. And I'd done radio adverts and, and sort of 30 second spots and things like that. So I was able to show I could script. And I, I pitched him a story and he said, it's very nice. We like it. However, Doctor Who's coming back. It's not been announced yet, but we're going to have a new Doctor. So we're not doing anything. And this was right before Russell announced uh, Eccleston. So I was kind of a bit disheartened, but I'd written this script. And because I'd written this Doctor Who script, I knew I could do comics. I'd looked at it. And I was in uh, New York City in April 2003 for Easter. I had some meetings just before and just after. And I worked out there was one afternoon between literally one o'clock and six o'clock where I had nothing to do. And so I contacted Marvel. I just phoned them up. Uh, no, so I contacted DC and phoned them up and said, um, can I speak to an editor? And I spoke to a guy called Mike Carlin, who was, a, you know, just, who had just picked up the phone at the time. I said, hello, my name's Tony Lee. I'm a British writer. Um, I'm in New York for the afternoon on this particular day. Uh, I'm seeing Marvel Comics at one o'clock. Can I come and see you guys at four? Now, he had no idea who I was. He had no idea what I was doing with Marvel Comics, but that was enough to make him go, well, if you're seeing them, I'll have a chat with you. So they booked me in to see me at, one, at four o'clock. I then emailed Marvel and said, hello, my name is Tony Lee. I'm a British writer. I'm seeing DC <laughs> Comics at four o'clock. Can I come and see you at one? And weirdly, I timed it perfectly because Marvel at the time was creating a new series called Epic, which was a new imprint where they wanted people who weren't comic writers. They wanted people from outside of the industry. And an editor named Teresa Fokarile turned up. Uh, she contacted me and said, yes, if you're around, we'll quite happily chat to you. And so I arrived uh, at Marvel on literally the Thursday before Good Friday, 2003, sat down with her for about two hours. She listened to me. She looked at my work because obviously I still had to prove I could do it. Uh, pitched loads of stuff. Uh, and then I went to DC, who spent an hour telling me that life was hard and I would end up being bitter, twisted and cry. And surprisingly enough, both sides worked because I got um, through through Teresa's meeting. I got a chance to pitch for X-Men. Uh, I did X-Men and that kept me, you know, obviously doing other bits and pieces. With DC, I didn't work for him for 10 years because they literally they were telling the truth. It was just you know a hard life, shall we say. But again, having X-Men Unlimited, I was then able to turn around to other companies and say, hi, I'd like to do something for you. What have I done? X-Men. So straight away, it got me in the door the same way that being a games reviewer in 20, you know, literally at this point, like, you know, 15 years earlier had done. And then from then I picked uh, Starship Troopers because that was a known title, so I could get that. Uh, and that brought me on to doing some other bits and pieces. And at this time, uh, I was chatting to, by randomly, I bumped into Clayton Hickman again and said, hey, look, you know, I'm now writing Marvel comics and I'm now doing these things. So if you ever need someone when this new series starts, let me know. Uh, and then the rest was history. Right. So, so, you, so you've got this growing um, career in graphic novels happening. Is that, is that like a term? Comic, what do we call them? Comics or graphic novels? Um, uh, it's both exactly the same. Uh, graphic novels is a term that people like to use to make themselves sound special and clever and not a comic reader. Okay. A comic is a graphic <laughs> novel. The, the terms are crazy. You can have a comic, which is often a 22-page comic, and then you collect these comics into a trade not a comic or if it's a long comic it can also be called a graphic novel but it's mainly terms for sellers waterstones for example or barnes and noble or places like that won't sell comics but they will sell graphic novels right <laughs> as far as i'm concerned i'm a comic writer you okay. know, no matter how long the comic is so your comic career grows over the next decade or so doctor who comes back how is it that you end up writing in 2011 for big finish um i became known as a fast writer 
Uh, one of the reasons I was writing for Marvel uh, with Spider-Man, for example, I did a couple of Spider-Man stories, was because an editor would contact me at, say, three in the afternoon and say, hey, we've just had someone drop out. Have you got a Spider-Man story? I did an 11 page Spider-Man story. And I'd say, give me three, give me two hours. I'll come back to you. And then I give them three ideas. And then by seven o'clock, they would say, we like this one. Can we have this one? And by 11 o'clock that night, they've got it. And this sounds fast and it is fast, but it's mainly because I came from journalism. I came from magazine writing where, you know, in journalism, when you're told to write a story, you say, when do you need it by? And they look at their watch. You know, you're taught by column inches rather than word count. So for me, sitting down and writing a comic was quite quick. And the way that uh, Big Finish happened, and it is, again, a bit of a roundabout way, was I'd contacted Clayton and said, whenever you need me, let me know. Uh, Clayton had, uh, by random chance, I contacted him on a day when someone had actually dropped out of a, of a three-part series uh, for Doctor Who magazine. And he said, we need this quite quickly. When could you get us some ideas? And I said, it's 10.30 now. You can have them by lunchtime. And he did. And we took those ideas and two of them got merged together. And we created a three part uh, Doctor Who magazine comic called FAQ. And the problem I had with FAQ was it was being written before Tennant had ever turned up because it was one of Tennant's first comic strips. And that meant we didn't know his voice. So it took us a while to wait to see what happens. We, this was being written when all we had actually seen was the 20 minutes he had in the Christmas special. So yep. we kind of knew he was a bit more sort of forceful. And that was it. Um, but that got me uh, into writing Doctor Who. Uh, IDW got the license for Doctor Who and started contacting people that had written for the magazine, but at the same time, they knew. And I'd spoken to IDW a couple of times over the years at San Diego Comic Con because I had other things I was pitching for. And <laughs> so this is something I've said a few times and it annoys certain people, but I'm going to say it anyway because you know I've hit that point now where I don't care. So IDW sent me an email that basically said, we've just bought the rights to Doctor Who. So this doctor, there's 10 of them, right? Do they all live in the same house? <laughs> that was the level of what they knew they'd bought. So I had to explain what Doctor Who was. Gary Russell took over doing the first arc and they brought me in to do a second arc. And then the, the arc was so popular and my arc was a primer. So basically the, um, the story was that the 10th Doctor had amnesia and was having to travel around a museum based on himself. And what it meant was he would regularly pick up an item that was relevant to a previous doctor. So the first doctor's cane or the second doctor's recorder or something like that. And then you'd go into an eight page story of that doctor. So in the process of the novel, uh, sort of the graphic novel or comic, uh, I did stories for effectively all 10 doctors. I mean, this was before the War Doctor, but it was everything all the way up to Eccleston as well. So it was done as a primer for fans. And when it came out, it was well received. I then started doing the ongoing and just carried on enjoying that as it went along. But what I had done at this, pre at this point is I'd shown I could write all Doctors. And my inner fandom had come out from this because I was putting in every little you know, Easter egg I possibly could. I even, you know, in the, in the run of the 10th Doctor, I even had a subplot that showed that the Peter Cushing Doctor Who is technically canon in the series as well. I went completely for it. You know, I th put the kitchen sink and everything in. And during this time, I was going to conventions in America, uh, Gallifrey One, Chicago Tardis, and at both of these, Big Finish would turn up and they would go along to these conventions. And I chatted to them, you know, I wasn't pitching to do it, but I always was kind of like, it would be fun. And then I was doing a school talk. And I, I remember I went to my old school. Um, I just won, actually it wasn't even a school talk. I'd just become the New York Times bestselling author uh, for Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, the graphic novel. Uh, it just come out. And I had gone to my old school to give a certificate to my old English teacher and we had like press and there was reporters and things like this and it was a very important day and I'm having to do all these bits and pieces and on my phone I get an email from Alan Barnes that just basically says hey Tony would you be interested in doing a Doctor Who for Big Finish and of course I'm like yes but I couldn't 
reply because I'm in the middle of this big event and there's, you know, there's cameras there. And in the end, I sort of say goodbye, get in the car, and I'm immediately texting back saying, yes, absolutely, what do you need? And the problem was is they had, and again, it was exactly the same as I had with um, everybody else, which was they turned around and said, somebody has fallen through. We have two weeks to get a story together. Um, you're fast. And that was kind of it. You're fast. We need, you know, we need to get a story together. Can you do this? And so I spoke to Alan the next day. We started moving backwards and forwards through a plot. And again, I'd sent him some ideas. I like the idea of using like the, the water, the tunnels under Dover because I'd recently been there. So they were fresh in my mind. And at that point, it was there was nothing to it. All I knew is it was going to be a fifth Doctor, uh, Tiga, Nissa, and Turlo. So is this and, the first audio you'd ever written? Audio play? Um, at this point, yes. I think I think I'd done this one before. Yes, I think I did this before I did any of the Bernie Summerfield ones. So yes, I think this was my first audio. Yeah, so okay. and if I'm being brutally honest, you can tell. <laughs> Because um, I'll, I'll put my hands up. This is not my best audio. And anybody who likes Rat Trap, God bless you. And anybody who doesn't un- like it that much, I can totally understand. Because it was written. I had to learn how to write audios while writing the audios. At the same time, uh, poor Alan Barnes was having to take, because he was script editing the series at the time. He had to take my stories and twist them into the uh, you know, the, the, the various things that had to be linked into the series because there was a whole load of things that needed to be done. It was a tough one for the fact that, you know, it wasn't just Doctor and Companion. It was Doctor and three companions. Yep. So there had to be a reason for all of them to be involved. And it was just, there was a lot of back and forth thing. And I think in the end, I think he ended up writing probably about a, a quarter to a third of the, of the, the um, audio just to make sure it fitted from place to place. Because it was my learning experience. I mean, I'll be honest, best learning experience I could ever get, but it was a learning experience. I mean, it, it, as much as you're fast, it seems strange to give a brand new skill to someone, but you obviously put it off, which is great. Is, is there much similarity between writing comics and writing a script for an audio? Well, this this is the weirdest thing, because there is and there isn't. Uh, and I, I, I now, I le- funny enough, years later, I lecture on, um, on stars of writing, but... Um, there's a lot of people go, if you can write a comic, you can write an audio. And during the times I'd been at Gallifrey One and chatting to people like Gary Russell, who had obviously been doing with Big Finish and, and uh, Nick Briggs and people like that, I'd shown I knew what I was talking about. And the fact that I had won awards and was you know, doing well with the comic showed I knew the world and who I could write dialogue. Because a lot of comic is dialogue. It's, it's visual, but the dialogue will pass the story along. Uh, screenplays are similar. Screenplays are very much that sort of thing. But the, the thing with audio is it's a completely, it's the coins being flipped on the head because it's it's dialogue, but there's no description because you can't just say to the artist, draw, you know, for example, you know, draw five rats in front of computers. You know, a, a comic artist could draw it and make it look incredible. But in an audio, you can't just say, Oh, look, Doctor, there's five rats sitting in front of computers. You kind of have to make it more natural, you know, in that kind of way. And so I think the first, I think I wrote, because it was in four parts, and I wrote the first part and sent it to Alan, and he came back going, right, these are all the things you need to learn. So by the time the second part came across, it was better. Uh, But at the same time is I was under a time crunch because I didn't have, most people who write a Doctor Who, audio will have the advantage of being able to go back and forth have a discussion look at what's to change we couldn't with this one this one had to be ready by this particular time and it was because um mark strickson uh, was in the uk yeah it, yeah it was it was literally a case of i think it was the case of um turlo whose name was completely mark strickson. mark strickson uh mark strickson was over from australia for a yeah. convention and it was literally a case of he was in on the friday so he could record his lines on the Friday. So it was literally a case of him and Janet would be on the Friday. Sarah and Peter would be on a Monday. I think it was something like that, but it was that quick. It was that kind of, we have to do it when they're here. Even if you only write the Turlo scenes by that Friday. But of course for me, I, I still couldn't get my head around 
writing out of order. So I, I just basically, in the end, Alan guided me the way I needed to go. And I actually, when I, when the book, when it was about to come out, I actually said it should have been Tony Lee and Alan Barnes because realistically he was involved as much as I was. So in terms of the actual idea, I mean, I'm not sure whether you know the kids book, Mrs. Fisby and the Rats of Nim at all. Um, I do know the Rats of Nim and there was an element of that that did kind of sneak in with this. Um, um, we had a lot of the original ideas kind of did fall out uh, as the story progressed because we didn't have the time to do some of the things we wanted to do. Uh, and Ken Deep, not Ken Deep, uh, Ken Deep runs a convention. Ken, Ken Bentley? Ken, Ken Bentley, Bentley was, was the director. director. Yep. Ken Bentley was the director. And he was able to sit down and go, right, we can get this done. We can do this. We can, we can play around with these sound effects and we can play it in this particular way. So that helped a lot because that was able to show me where we could go. But the more he came in, the more things like Secret of Nim and stuff like that kind of fell backwards a little bit because you had to focus on what you could get away with. Hmm. And it's like, I don't know if you have those... Um, I mean, in England, we have them. In America, we have them. the shows where they say, hey, the family's gone out, so we've got a day to fix their house. So now we're going to go and paint their rooms in the hours that we've got. Yep. And when you watch it, the last kind of like the last two hours of the day are them just frantically papering over things and going, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. That was kind of how this plot was. This is kind of how the audio went. It was it was great and it was and I think it was you know, a, a good story but at the same time I was aware that there were things that were sadly lacking I wanted to do more for Janet for example I didn't feel she had enough of a story you know I wanted to do more on some of the dialogue that Peter had because he ended up being quite on the nose uh, and things like that but you are just stuck with the, with the deadline and I think with comics I'd been spoiled because you have a deadline to write the comic you get the comic done the artist draws it but then when the letter is lettering it, you can come back and go, actually, can we change these lines? With this, you couldn't. It was already recorded. Yeah. Did you go into the re for the recording? I went in on the first day and with hindsight, I probably shouldn't have. Because I was very excited. Uh, I was a kid in a sweet shop. You know, I'm sitting there with... With um, actually no, I think it was Mark Strickson and Je and Dave Peter Davison won the Monday, and it was um, Sarah and Janet on the Friday. And going in, you know, I was chatting away to obviously I had I'm I'm sitting on a sofa with Janet Fielding, Sarah Sutton, Terry Malloy, who was playing one of the voices, you know, and I'm sitting there as a kid who grew up in Doctor Who with all these people, and they're reading my story. And I don't think there was an, uh, maybe there was an arrogance to me. I kind of felt like this is, you know, I, I belong here. And I do, and I, th I feel that if I hadn't been there, I would have enjoyed it a lot more because I did start to feel that I shouldn't have been there. I felt like they were just getting on with their job. Whereas for me, this was an incredibly important thing. And as the day went on, I realized these guys don't think this is as great as I seem to think it is. I need to just to kind of back away a little bit, if that makes sense. But I mean, sitting in the in the um, in the in the studio with uh, with Ken as they're in their booths was absolutely amazing. And this was back in the days before iPads. And one of the rules they had, which I hadn't realised at this point, was obviously they only had three pages per scene because you had to have one in one hand, one in front, and one on the side. You couldn't turn them because you could hear the turning of the paper. Nowadays with iPads, you can have a scene as long as you want because you're just scrolling and it's silent. But this was something I'd never seen until I was actually watching. And of course, I had the legendary Toby lunch. So that was also quite nice. But yeah, I mean, with hindsight, looking back at it a good decade later, I wish I hadn't gone because I do feel that I lost a little bit of the Disney magic, if that makes sense, by going in the room and watching it. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So you were back, uh, another story that the year for part of the Bernie Summerfield series the Epoch. Um, with Private Enemy Number One, yes. Um, so they were, they were happy enough with your work and said, "Come straight, come back straight away and do some more writing for us." Uh, possibly not. Actually, I'll be utterly honest, um, and I, I will be honest. I got, I had the feeling that I'd come in quick and I'd filled a hole, but there was still a queue of people behind me who were just as good, if not better, who could still do Doctor Who, and I was never given another Doctor Who to do. Uh, but Gary Russell. Uh, who was running the Bernie Summerfield and who also was running um, the second series of Bernie Summerfield with Scott Hancock, who then was running the um, uh, Dorian Gray series. These guys 
turned around and said, look, you know, come along, do some stuff with us. And so with Bernie Summerfield, I've been a massive Lisa Bellman fan for years. Bernie was, you know, I've, from, since the Virgin books came out, I've always been a Benny Somerville, a uh, Summerfield, <laughs> Benny Somerville, Benny Summerfield fan. And having the opportunity to do them kind of gave me the opportunity to prove that I wasn't a one hit wonder. You know, I was able to sit down and go, no, actually, I can prove now that this is better and I can do something a lot nicer. And it was a shorter story because it wasn't effectively a two hour story. It was only an hour. I got to really push it. I got to play with things I wanted to do. Um, The Vesuvius Falling, which was the second one, I actually felt was possibly one of the best audios I've ever done uh, because I got a chance to really take Benny and do stuff that she'd not done in the audios, which was she's an archaeologist. Let's have her do archaeology. And she's effectively solving a murder that happened 4,000 years earlier. And so that for me was was good. I, I felt that I'd kind of exorcised my Doctor Who ghosts by doing that one. I was saying to Dwayne, actually, before you came on, that Vesuvius Falling is my favourite story that you wrote. Oh, thank you. Um, it, it, for me, it really was because, um, I mean, originally it was called CSI Space because we thought that'd be quite funny. But the problem with the Epoch storyline was I was the story that led to the nothing. So my plot for the, for the Epoch was very much, you have to end everything. No matter what you do, everything ends. Which really threw a lot of what I wanted to do, because you couldn't, you always had that ticking clock that you had to do. And it wasn't a deadline ticking clock this time. This time it was a minute ticking clock. You know, you knew that by 45 minutes, your story had to effectively merge into this. Uh, But with Vesuvius falling, it was a complete standalone. I got to have Braxia telling it, even if it was for like a cameo. And I kind of understood where Benny was going. But unfortunately, uh, around this time, Big Finish decided that Benny was going a different direction. And so... Um, I think Scott was running at the time and Gary were running at the time. They stepped off. And because they stepped off, they'd been the people offering me the opportunities. So the opportunity stopped. Okay. So your career's then taken a much bigger place as you started writing a lot more novels for, for reluctant readers, other comics. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I mean, the reason I stopped mainly, I mean, I'd, the reason I stopped even pitching Big Finish is um, I'd, I'd kind of wanted to know what what had happened because I did feel that after Doctor Who, uh, I'd screwed up or something. I just felt there was, I, I, I felt that I'd done, I, I wasn't invited to the party, if that makes sense. You know, I just felt there was, a, there was something that I needed to clear the air on. And as it was, there wasn't. It was just, I just convinced myself so much that I'd done bad that I just had, you know, just given myself this kind of closed off impression. But at the same time, I'd started writing for Audible and I was doing um, I just I'd done a um, Sherlock Holmes and Dorian Gray uh, graphic um, uh, Audible adventure and not Audible. Sorry, um, Big Finish and Audible had contacted me in relation to a book I'd written that was supposed to be a graphic novel and then turned into a novel that they had the rights to. And I turned that into a 13 part story. And the moment I started doing this. I enjoyed doing the audio dramas, but it felt completely different. And I can't explain it, but doing it, I felt, I think it was possibly because I'd grown up reading, sorry, listening to Big Finish. And with Audible, I hadn't really got much knowledge of them apart from narrations of books. So when it came to full cast dramas, I didn't have that pressure on me to match to, you know, to... To, to, to Rob Shearman or to, to John Dorney or whoever it was that I was following. So it was, a, it was a lot more freeing for me. And, and in the meantime, I was still doing the comics. I was still doing graphic novels. Um, I'd started doing reluctant reader novels because at the time I was doing my talks about this. Uh, and I started working in film and TV, working, did a couple of things for BBC. I started doing script doctoring for uh, American studios. A couple of years ago on the show, someone recommended your adaptation of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is interesting in itself because it stars Terry Malloy and Terry Malloy yes. was in Rat Trap also. So, um, and it was only, I, I bought it from Audible a couple of years ago and I'd forgotten about it until we were going to speak to you and I dug it out and listened to it uh, this week. What an amazing uh, adaptation of the story, putting uh, putting Terry Malloy 
in that lead role. Um, what's that like as an, as, uh, as an experience for you, adapting a story as opposed to creating a story? Here's the weird thing again about this is because um, although it was an audible, it was actually produced by Barnaby Eaton Jones. And um, Barnaby Eaton Jones uh, does Spiteful Puppet, which is an order. He, he does a, f- a few things, but Spiteful Puppet is one of the things he does. And he'd contacted me. Gary Russell had passed the details on a few years ago. He'd contacted me to do a Robin of Sherwood audio drama. And again, I, I'm a big Robin of Sherwood fan. I mean, I mean, obviously, if people are going to hear this. They're not going to see this, but you guys can see behind me. I have Robin of Sherwood's Albion signed by Michael Prade. You know, so I'm a massive fan of this. And again, the opportunity to write for these people. And my fear was what happened to me when I did Big Finish. My fear was I'd got so excited about doing Doctor Who that I'd possibly put too much in. My fear was with Robin of Sherwood that I would do the same. So I had to really step back and look at it properly, come up with a story which wasn't Robin, you know, and as it was, I was able to fit it into a certain area. And when that was done, Barnaby contacted me and said, we absolutely love this. We are working with Audible to do 20,000 leagues. Would you be interested? And at the time, and this is something that obviously wasn't known at the time, at the time they were talking to Sam Neill to get him to do it. And it was planned that he would be recording it when he was in London. And again, we're down to that. We need the scripts by this set time because, you know, Sam Neill's going to be here in these days. So I was very much a case of aware that I was doing page upon page upon page in the space of a week just to make sure it was done. Uh, And then he couldn't make it. And then COVID hit. So it just threw everything back. And in the end, I mean, a a full credit to Barnaby on this. If, If you enjoyed it, all of that was recorded during lockdown. Every single piece of that was edited, recorded. All the actors were, you know, under blankets and things recording in the early days before people had even worked at how to make studios. So, you know, the fact it was done was incredible. With 20,000 leagues, we had one massive problem, which we didn't realise until the editor started going through it with me. Um, Because I was writing it and then it was going off to an editor at Audible who was going through it and then coming back with things that needed to be changed. She kept coming back, changing all these things. And I kept returning to her and saying, you can't change that. That's verbatim from the book. You know, you can't say this. This is a completely different thing because this is the book. And we realized very quickly that we both had different translations of the book. Uh, because obviously it's a French novel and there's been about half a dozen different translations into English and hers was completely different. So she was changing these dialogue lines and we had to sort of look at it and go, okay, which one is the bigger seller? Because we'll go with whatever one that one is. But the biggest thing with that, and it's the thing I do with all my stories is I love the research. You know, it's great to sit down and write a story, but I love finding things that no one else has looked at. And the thing that got me with um, with this one originally was that Nemo wasn't. You know, Nemo is known to be an Indian, you know, effectively an Indian Maharaja who, you know, he was in Mysterious Island. He's shown to be this man. But in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, he was Polish. Originally, he was going to be a Polish captain and it was taken out. But because of that, it was never said what he was. He, you know, he didn't say what nationality, where he came from. He was a man of the sea which meant as far as I was concerned, we could have anybody do it. And so that gave me that kind of twist to that side. The other problem we had with 20,000 Leagues was, as ever, it's a man-filled story. You know, there's I I think there's literally like barely any females at all in this story whatsoever because it was a story of its time. So we had to find a way of not only bringing females into the story, but making them actually relevant not just having them there to hand what hand ring and go oh my god what are we going to do i had to make them a lot stronger so therefore there was aspects of the plot that i had to add to taking from the original notes and things that he was looking to do in future stories that we could bring in and like for example how we need to the first mate and and stuff like that we were bringing these characters in that didn't exist and i was worried about that because i knew the first thing that would happen is you'd have people going no, he's had to change the sex of this character. No, it's all wokeness. But at the same time, I feel it worked. And I feel that it actually made the story more relevant for the current times. And I was over the moon uh, when I obviously, when I saw the casting, because between 
doing 20,000 leagues and it being recorded, I'd also written 13 episodes of Dodge and Twist, which was the adaptation of my own book. So having them both come out with these massive casts was just mind blowing for me because with Doctor Who, you've got your main characters and probably two or three actors who play four or five roles. But with Audible and, you know, and with anything Audible are doing, they have the budget to throw out a whole load of more people. Although several of the people in that are Barnaby Eaton Jones in the background, basically just being crowds and stuff like that. But I'm glad you like it, though. I, it is one of my favourites. But Dodge and Twist is actually my favourite I ever did. Very good. So, so, so what's, what's your big passion project at the moment? What are you, what's about to come out? What are you excited about? Um, to be honest, um, my passion project has been happening for a couple of years now. Um, so when the pandemic hit, um, I, like many other writers, was utterly screwed because I had five incomes coming in. Uh, I had film and TV. I had comics. Well, film and TV stopped instantaneously. Comics imploded, mainly because comic stores closed. But, you know, obviously a lot of the publishers started laying people off. Um I did audio dramas, but suddenly everybody was pitching audio dramas because it was the only thing that could still go on. <clears throat> so the queues became longer. Uh, I did conventions, which were not happening. And I did school talks, which weren't happening. So around the middle of 2020, I realized that if things didn't fix, probably by around February, I was going to have to quit writing. And this is something I'd been doing effectively since, you know, 1987. And talking to a friend of mine, uh, who had gone through a similar thing about a year earlier, funny enough, um, he aimed me at a different area. He said, look, you know, you need a creative output. You haven't got one. Uh, you like crime stories and things like that. And I had played around with doing some crime novels and uh, crime TV shows. He said, you know, you should be doing crime novels uh, and working with Amazon and doing them through them. And, and he he's a children's book writer called Barry Hutchinson, who now writes crime novels as J.D. Kirk. He's incredibly successful. And so I, I looked at this and thought, I need something to do or I'm going to go crazy and I shall do this. And so basically I created a fake name for myself called Jack Gatland, because if I'd have been writing him as Tony Lee, Amazon would have been aiming them at my previous audience, which at this point was eight to 14 year old children who had been reading my reluctant reader books. And I don't think they would have been appreciative of, hey, kids, you like Tony's work? Here's a murder. I, th I think there was. I thought better to do a, a, a fake pen name. I created my own publishing company to do it, uh, which is Hooded Man Media, uh, which was Hooded Man because, again, I was changing my identity and Robin Hood would always hide his identity. And I started writing crime books. I took some TV shows I'd written that hadn't got anywhere or had gone into turnaround over time, and I kind of scrubbed the uh, serial numbers off and set them all within the same detective inspector and his team. And I started writing these books and I'd, I'd write the books and it became very much a, um, a homegrown uh, industry. I would write my stories. I would get them edited by other, um, you know, by professional editors, make sure they weren't rubbish. I'd have them put together. I'd get them sorted. And then I would put them out onto digital first through Amazon and have them published. And it was a way first off just to keep myself going to prove that I still had it. Uh, it was a way under a fake name to prove I wasn't just selling on my own brand uh and at this moment i mean i'm looking across to the side because in front of me i've got 11 novels in the di declan walsh series that have come out in the last two years i've got a, a spin-off called paint the dead which is uh just starting a new series and a dan brown kind of clone called the lionheart curse which has come out and in the last just under two years i started in november 2020 i've had 70 million page reads and over a hundred thousand copies bought and it's just changed my life because it's become now what i'm doing and because of what's coming through that i'm still writing these novels but now i'm also able to come along and go right i'm going to do the comics i always wanted to do because i can fund them so i'm paying artists to do the comics i can never do i'm looking at audio dramas that i've always wanted to take and how i can play that i'm you know i recently sat down with barnaby and did the adaptation of my audio sherlock um audio robin hood story purely because i could and suddenly i'm in this position where i don't need to pitch people anymore i don't need to look for work anymore which means i can do what i want and it means i can 
contact these, you know, I can go back to Big Finish and go, hey, do you want to do something? If not, no worries. I'm not nervous about it anymore. And it's the best thing that could ever have happened to me. Well, can I say, Tony, that's really exciting. Um, I also want to say, listen, thank you for your time, but can I say you're underrating Rat Trap? Um, for a first audio, it is spectacular. So I hadn't realized it was thank the you. first thing you ever wrote. So I, I think that's, you know, to come up with something and do that in two weeks is astounding. As, as I said, as I said, Alan obviously takes, uh, he's, there's a lot of credit that isn't there for Alan. He really did show me how to do this. Um, and thank you for that. I mean, I do have a lot of people who come to me and say Rat Trap's their favourite audio, and then I tell them they should go and buy more audios. But to be <laughs> honest, um, I enjoyed it. I thought well, it was good. I'm and not saying that. It's a, it's a solid story. You get you give the companions, all of them have something to do, which is hard work when you've got a TARDIS team that's tied up. Um, and, yeah, we certainly enjoyed listening to it. I know for Dwayne in particular, he, uh, his, his opinion of it increased greatly. Well, I, I appreciate that, and thank you so much. I mean, as I said, it, it's it is a kind, it's a bittersweet audio for me. Uh, and when you guys first said to come on and talk about it, I almost said no because you know, as far as I'm concerned, there is a part of me that thinks this is the audio that killed my chances of writing any more audios for Big Finish because it was such a quite turn turnaround, and and I wasn't ready. I think if I'd have if I'd have come in to write the Doctor Who audios at the time that I was writing, say, Dodge and Twist or Twenty thousand leagues when i'd done a couple of small bennies or something like that if i hadn't been thrown in a deep end at the start i think it would have been probably the same story but i, I would have been able to give a voice to it a lot better but at the end of the day you know there are other writers out there who are just as good if not well there, there's other writers who are far better than me lisa mcmullen's incredible mm. and as far as i'm concerned i'd much rather listen to them do them than actually try again to write one well, I'm still hoping that you come back at some points. Listen, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it, guys. And if you do want me to come back and write, just contact Big Finish and, and hashtag it. We know this is utterly pointless, but... And, and see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Cortex Systems Exploration Ship Vesuvius. Calling all ships in the vicinity. So I'm guessing you want us to take a look, look about, gather some data... No. I want you to take a look and tell me whether it's safe to blow it from the sky. Hang on to your hat, sweetie pie. I found you a space. <laughs> Don't you just love this guy? So oh, deeply. You are crazy! Sit down and tell me what you remember. It might surprise you. Not much does these days, but hey, give it a try. Do you believe in time travel? <laughs> what? You're seriously asking me that? And so, here you are now, centuries later, the infamous Mr. Dorian Gray and his portrait. It was stolen from me centuries back. Literally vanished from the face of the earth. But that's just a story. A book. It isn't real. I mean, you can't be real. Oh, oh, that's, that's, oh my god, it's rising. Where are you taking me on this so-called leisure drive across Legion's less than charming surface? We're going shopping. Shopping? Well, yes. We're in the market for a bit of real estate. Time until impact. 58 minutes and counting. Whatever that thing is, it isn't dead. It just, well, it just isn't alive. Come on, Ruth. Looks like a mystery. Yay. They used to say this house attracts nothing but evil. What are we all doing here, I wonder? <laughs> Well, that was a fascinating chat with Tony. Thanks for uh, organising that, Philip. No, that's okay. Yeah, I always love hearing from the author's point of view what they're doing and what they're, what they're trying to achieve. What a massive career he's got away from Big Finish. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, let's uh, pick another couple of stories for next month's Randomoids. And uh, I'm going to hit the button. Right, Did I start the music? There's the music. Let's hit the button. And now, Philip, while I was looking at the screen waiting for the randomoid selectatron to do its magic for us. I remembered that last month when I was unhappy about this month's selections, you picked another one. You said, do you want to know what's next? And I was a little bit disappointed because I was excited uh, about what came up next. So I'm going to go with that one. Shall we go with that one? Do you remember what it was? No, I've got no idea. All Consuming Fire. So we haven't reviewed a novel adaptation before. Oh, okay. So yep. this is what we're going to do. Not only does it 
Is it a novel ad adaptation? It's also got Sherlock Holmes in it, played by Nicholas Briggs. So there's a couple of good things to look forward to in that. So that's our first one, All Consuming Fire. Let's go for the second one, shall we? All right, the second one we're going to have a look at is an Eighth Doctor and Lucy Miller story. Oh, Does that yeah. sound okay? No, that sounds great. Uh, this is going to release in July 2009. It's from the second series, I think, or is it the third series? Third series. It's called The Scapegoat by Pat Mills. And I don't remember much about it at all. And speaking, you mentioned Samantha Bond before. She's in it. Okay. So that could be interesting. Got Clifford Rose in it too. He's still Good grief. He's... Uh, Rovic uh, from uh, Warriors Gate. Oh, okay. Is that Clifford Rose? I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. I, I could be wrong, folks. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so, yeah, those two are going to be our picks for next month's Randomoids. I'm very much looking forward to them. And uh, I hope I'm not disappointed now, Philip. I may have built them up too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go into our recommendations for this week. And what I'd like to... Rec no. It's not going to happen. It's got to be you, Philip. Well, I've already foreshadowed what I'm going to recommend. I'm going to recommend a book which you can get on audio uh, as well, so you can listen, listen to this if you want to. I'm going to recommend Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Um, so it's by uh, the, the author uh, Robert uh, C. O'Brien. Yes, Robert C. O'Brien. I want to make sure I've got the initial right. He, the other fantastic book he also wrote was a book called Zed for Zachariah. Um, which is something that I actually started while I was in high school, which I'm not sure whether you would remember or not. So Zephyr Sakurai... The, was, the name rings a bell. It was turned to a film as well, though the film's nowhere near as good as, as the book. It's about um, the world is basically destroyed by nuclear weapons, and there's one girl, or well, her family, who live in a valley. They're, they're farming family. They, they farm in a valley, and that valley has been protected from the nuclear radiation that's happened all around them. And... Um, well, first, first her brother goes off. To, well, we don't see this, but her brother goes off to try and find out what's happened. Never returns. The parents go looking for their son. They never return, and she's there by herself. She's about sixteen years old, and she spends the next six months, nine months, twelve months by herself. And then someone comes wandering in with a cart in a radiation suit, and um, there's two water sources in the valley. One is polluted by the radiation, but one's fresh because it's underwater. And he tests one of the water supplies, but assumes, and actually then goes and bathes in other water, but it's actually the radioactive one, which he doesn't realise. So he gets really sick, and he's unconscious for a large part, and she's bringing him back to life and looking after him with all his radiation sickness. And she just calls him Zachariah, last man on earth, Zephyr Zachariah. But then it actually all starts to turn a bit sinister. <laughs> um, and so it's a, it's a great suspense story, just really two characters in it but really, really worth reading. But it's a utopian dystopia. So that's one of his, that one of his stories. Um, it's other stuff as well. But then the, the one I want to recommend as well is Rats, The Rats of Nim, um, which was also turned into a movie, a cartoon, and it is awful. Like, okay. they, they totally destroyed everything about the book when they made this movie. Um, and so I think I used, to, I used to teach it to my class, Year 5, Year 6, and we used to actually watch the movie to see how you can actually destroy something really well when you leave behind the book and leave behind the things of the book. So, yeah, so read the book, watch the movie, um, or listen to the book. But it's a really fascinating tale focused, as I said, I'm not a big animal person. And, you know, these talking mice and, you know, I was, uh, you know, these mice that live in this house and they talk and it was all a bit sort of, yeah. But when, he, when the story gets told about NIM, um, the National Institute of Medical something or other, which is where there were these all these rats were experimented on. You, cut, you start to understand what's been going on, um, and there's there's a couple of plots happening. There's a plot in terms of the houses in the field that they're living living in, but one of the the baby one of the children mouse is too sick to move, um, but the farmer's coming for the harvest. But so the rats have to move the house. But there's also people coming for the rats. So there's all these complications, but wonderful stories. You will love it. So. Mrs. Frisbee and the rest of them, and read to your kids, Dwayne. They would love it. Okay. I will. Now, what about you? What, what do you want to recommend? I am going to recommend something that I think has already been recommended to us by one of our guests. But I th listening to the Rat Trap by Tony Lee was one thing, but then Terry Malloy being in the cast also reminded me that Tony Lee had adapted 
an audible version of a full cast uh, drama, audible version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And I think that was originally recommended to us by Rob Valentine a couple of years ago. And I purchased it at the time, but never listened to it. And I enjoyed Rat Trap so much that I, I, I dug this out, if you can dig out downloads uh, on my phone, and I started listening to it. It's a five-part series, 45 to 50 minutes per episode. Terry Malloy is probably the main cast member because he does a lot of the storytelling, narration, but it's done in such a beautiful, unique way. The music is wonderful. It's if you if you're looking for a if if you this is probably uh, very uh, naughty of me to say but if you're ever after a break from Big Finish and you want something that's a little bit different check this out because the production is completely different and it's wonderful I absolutely adore it I'm a couple of episodes in now and uh, it's it's got me riveted there's not many things that have me riveted and and sort of decide to keep listening without you know i sit there with a cup of coffee not doing anything listening it's that good because like, often you listen to audio drama while you're doing other things but this is this is not what this has done for me it's made me actually stop and make time to listen to it so Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea it's not an audio book it's audio book it's a full cast audio drama only available on audible uh, I highly, highly recommend it. Adapted by Tony Lee, starring Terry Malloy. There you go. That's my recommendation. Sounds fantastic. Okay, great. Okay, that's it for this instalment of The Sirens of Audio. Thank you so much for joining us. Leave a comment uh, if you're watching via YouTube. Leave us a review if you're listening on a podcast version as well. Uh, we, we love all those uh, lovely vibes that we get from your good comments and reviews. So thank you so much for that. Thanks for uh, being with me, Philip been a pleasure. Thanks for being with me, Dwayne. We'll catch you next time. Bye, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 118, Randomoids 12, featuring a storm of angels and rat trap with our guest Tony Lee and your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. You can contact us or check out all our details at sirensofaudio.com. You can drop us a line via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or post a comment on our socials or our YouTube channel. Let us know your thoughts on this or any one of our episodes. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.